Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Pankaj Agrawal. He is the founder and CEO of Panitech Power, a serial entrepreneur who has successfully incubated, scaled, and exited many businesses, including IPO at London Stock Exchange. He is an expert in clean technology. He has over 30 years experience in creating multiple renewable energy sectors, and he has done a lot of uh, cross-border technology transfer between Europe and India. His background, he is a chemical engineer with a bachelor's in technology from IIT Kanpur. He has a PhD from University of Florida and an MBA from Rotterdam School of Management. So today he's going to talk about his company Panitech and some of the projects at Panitech, which provide clean water solutions to India. With that, over energy, to not you. clean energy, not water, but clean energy. Clean but energy. Yeah. My apologies. Clean no, no, energy no, solutions no to India. Uh, uh, so go ahead. Over to you, Pankaj. Well, uh, uh, thanks, Anesh. Thanks, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present. And uh, you know, uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you guys are. Um, you know, Dinesh, um, uh, when he asked me to present, make this presentation, I I, I looked at sort of the, 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 the YouTube channel and the, the different presentations that were there, the part of this, uh, 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 this, uh, this series. And I was a bit, I have to say, I was a bit intimidated by the kind of knowledge and the expertise that exists in there. And just a fair warning, today the presentation that I'm going to make is going to be extremely high level, very, very non-technical. And if it is, you know, yeah, uh, maybe too to mundane then yeah to do do let me know but we are keep it um, keep it relatively um, informal so uh, feel free to jump in comment uh, uh, interrupt ask questions anytime uh, you'd like um, um, so with that maybe I'll, so um, uh, so yeah so what, what I'm going to talk about today is you know uh, you know what 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 a company is doing and what we are so we all know, for, you know, that the world is um, trying to get towards net zero, and what we believe is, as a company, and uh, as a, that the state of our technologies will, uh, or technologies is going to play a very, very, very important role in achieving net net zero targets. Right. Uh, today's talk will focus, or, or the presentation will focus more on the energy sector, which is one of the areas of our expertise. So this is what. I'm going to focus on today. Uh, I think a couple of people are expecting water. If there is any specific water-related questions, we can always address at a later point. Just to sort of set the stage uh, a little bit and globally, uh, to achieve net zero globally, I think what is one one thing that's going to be very important is a lot of demand has to be converted to electrification. Uh, electrification has to happen in a lot of areas. Right. Today, for example, if you look at the total energy uh, to total um, share of electricity in the total energy consumption in the world is about 20%. And according to the calculation by IEA, International Energy Agency, um, to really to, to achieve net zero by 2050, the portion the, the, of that electricity uh, has to re increase up to 52%. And 80% of that has to come from renewable energy sources. So that is one of the tasks that we are talking about. And this is what is, sort of, uh, is going to drive some of the points that I'm making in the presentation today and some of the work that we are doing. Essentially, you know, what is the impact of electrification of demand? You know, electrification of mobility, which is happening, of course, but also electrification of the industry. So for example, steel, steel industry is moving from a carbon to hydrogen as a reducing agent, which means production of hydrogen using electrolyzers, which means electrification of, of the steel industry, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of other areas besides the traditional places where you see electricity consumption is going to get uh, electrified, right? And that has, is going to have a huge impact uh, uh, on, 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 on the way things work, right? And of course, um, because renewables are going to play a very important role, uh, and of course, you know, ultimately, uh, cost is an important driver for everybody, right? But if you look at today, renewables are already cheaper than fossil fuels. That's the very, very good news, right? So today, if you look in the last years, uh, the price of uh, 
our renewable energy, particularly solar PV, has really dropped dramatically. Of course, uh, various, uh, various countries, various governments have had uh, support mechanisms, whether it's policy support or uh, other types of support. Considering everything, the price of uh, PV, for example, in India, which is going to be one of the focus of, of this presentation today, is almost at about three to four cents per unit. That's the good news, which means that you know much much cheaper than than coal, particularly new coal. Any new installation has been done. But of course, it has challenges because renewables, unlike a traditional power plant, is intermittent. So solar, of course, you know when there's sunlight, you have solar. In the evening, you need solar energy. You don't have. Uh, you need to. Uh, um, shift so, uh, from from morning to evening. Wind energy is intermittent, so that has challenges. And grids don't like it, and that is what is going to also drive a lot of the innovation, which is driving a lot of innovation, a lot of technology that needs to be developed or is it being developed to make that transition happen. Right. So essentially, what that means is that you know. The, the, the structure of the grid, the whole plumbing, the way sort of the electricity is delivered is, is basically transforming. I'm sure that a lot of this I'm saying is probably obvious to everybody, but still, you know, just to reiterate the point that, you know, uh, the traditional view of the grid was that you had large power plants and you had a consumer and power plants as a coal based or a nuclear hydro power plant produce electricity, and the consumer consume electricity, and every end of the month, you got a bill, and what you really cared about was, you know, how how cheap, how expensive is my power, right? But now the whole system is changing with the intermittency of the of the renewable energy, with the decentralization of the renewable energy. Of course, coal power plants or nuclear power plants by nature have to be very very big to be commercially viable, gigawatt scale. But the advantage of renewable energy is that they can be very decentralized. That also changes the whole topology of the of the grid, the way the whole you know uh, generation happens, and also consumption happens. Right. So we are moving away from moving from a sort of a you know, one-way relationship, top-down relationship, to a much more network relationship where there is not just single uh, uh, information based on information flow, but really a, a two-way information flow where you have you know, essentially uh, not a consumer but a consumer. Right, and where smart grid digitalization of the grid is a glue that binds everything together. Right, and in, in according to this, uh, the Energy Transitions Commission, which is a coalition of companies and financial institutions, uh, the, the, the estimate is that for, for this transformation to happen every year until 2050 to achieve net zero, about $1.1 trillion per annum would need to be spent on this transformation. This is on top of all the renewable energy that needs to be added. And so you're talking about a huge change that is happening, huge investment requirements, also huge technological innovation, et cetera, et cetera. That's what's driving some of the work that we are doing, we're trying to do. So just switching gears now to India, because that's what you know we, we, I, I will focus on. And, and, and from the work that we're doing in India, we believe has also relevance to many of the other emerging markets as well, like Africa and other places as well. But I'll talk about India because India is where our focus is, India is where we what we understand and try to see if there are any lessons that we can draw from what we are doing for other geographies or other places where they might be even might have interest. Right? So India, if you look at India today, uh, India today relies heavily on fossil fuel. More than 70% of our energy comes from fossil fuels mostly coal and, and, and hydrocarbons. And per capita consumption is very, very low compared to, for example, China and the US and the EU, right? So if you combine the two, and as India is growing, as you all know, India is one of the fastest growing large economies. As India grows, and as India grows, as India industrializes, uh, the per capita, per capita consumption also increases. Uh, to, to, to achieve any kind of target. So India has committed to achieve net zero by 2070. And to achieve that, you know, is going to take a very, very, very important role in that energy mix. Right? And, and, and so, which also means that 
India has actually an opportunity even to leapfrog from the traditional way of delivering, producing, delivering energy to the new way of producing, delivering energy. And that's what we are, something we are seeing in India. And what, like what happened with mobile telephony in India, I, I remember uh, in the 80s when I left India, you know, our landlines in never worked. Today, India has one of the largest and the best mobile phone network in the world because we just didn't have a legacy system we could really leapfrog to a new way of doing things. So, and that's what is sort of what we believe is happening and will happen in India and probably set a template for what can happen in some other parts of the world where the legacy systems are, are not very strong. I just want to interrupt just briefly. Yes, hey, Nash, is it possible? Is it possible to um, mute Greg? Yes, that would be great. Let me do that. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Much better. Thank I you. Should have done that. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I guess uh, any questions or if you have any questions, please also feel free to interrupt me or ask me. But I think these are kind of you know things which are stating the obvious here. So in, in terms of uh, where does uh, you know what's happening in India? So as I mentioned that you know India, of course, um, renewables will play a very important role as India grows, and Indian government has of course very ambitious targets of renewables. Uh, uh, the government has announced that you know net zero policy of Indian government relies very very heavily heavily on renewables. And uh, according to the targets that we have, um, in the next 10 years, almost 500 gigawatts of renewable power needs to be added to the grid, which means about, about half a billion dollars in, in, in investment. And you're taking, you know, of course, the whole transformation has very, uh, various aspects. I've just pick, picked out three aspects, which is which are going to drive and focus on what is energy storage, which is going to be very, very important for. Uh, both for energy shift from a solar PV from morning to evening, or whether it's uh, uh, frequency regulation, demand side management, et cetera, et cetera. Energy storage is going to pay, play a very important role. Uh, of course, mobility, energy storage will play a very important role in mobility. Uh, green fuels like hydrogen, uh, et cetera, will play a very important role um, in, in, in India to achieve net zero. And of course, demand side flexibility, uh, energy efficiency, uh, digitalization, etc. They're going to take their important role, and th and these sectors in themselves would require huge, huge amounts of investment, and not just money investment, but investment in technology, getting technology from from Europe or North America, wherever the technology is. That's that's what we are talking about. That's the thing we are talking about. So 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 where does uh, where does Pani Tech Power Group company fit in, and who who are we? We are we are basically a uh, Europe and India based venture builder with the idea of learning from the experience this is that Europe and America has in developing some of these technologies and bringing them to India and not as consultants really as partners and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we are doing it in India I'll let's state with a couple of examples of a couple of things that we have done just to show how how it works and what the challenges are are doing uh, you know, bringing these kind of things from a to, to a country like India. Yeah, we are uh, uh, based in uh, uh, headquarters are in Switzerland, with an office in the UK and in in, in India. We are present in um, in, in Europe and India. Yeah. So essentially, um, uh, of course, uh, transferring to, cutting the technology to India, which is sort of our our focus. Um, um, our team, we have a very experienced team with a lot of expertise in, in clean tech uh, from the technology side. So, uh, you know, I'm myself, I'm a chemical engineer. My team has electrical engineers, uh, uh, software engineers, etc. cetera. Uh, we have a lot of experience in energy markets and regulations because we're talking about a huge transformation that's happening. So it's not only the introduction of technology, but also you know, the way things are being done, so which also means uh, how the markets work, how the regulatory environment works, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so learning also from the regulatory environment in Europe, trying to see how that can be done 
being brought to India. Uh, operations, we have uh, the team has deep expertise in operations, uh, you know, bringing actually technologies to, to India. And of course, multicultural because technology transfer, I think uh, understanding various cultures also is plays a very, very, very important role in any kind of technology transfer. We have access to world class companies which have the technology and blue chip Indian stakeholders with whom we work to transfer the technologies. And of course, we have a track record in digital businesses and technology transfer. We've chosen three focus areas um, uh, because based on the expertise that we have, that already is a huge, huge, um, 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 uh, let's say, field. And when we, when we engage the company, when we talk to a company for Indian market, what we look at is, of course, it should be relevant, Indian relevant, which means that any technology should be enabling, uh, you know, the, the, the goal of net zero uh, should be, we always focus on, the technology which are commercially ready. India is a complex market. Uh, so we always work with technologies which have been uh, proven commercially in the home market, and they should be ready to transfer to, to India, a country like India, because transfer of, 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 of knowledge is a very important part of what we do. These companies should also be primarily, these companies are typically leaders in the home market and also scalable because they're very niche, a product or niche technology, then that's probably not the right uh, thing for India, right? So in terms of we have what we have done is what we've seen from the experience that we have is that uh, uh, what we are trying to do here is not just doing when you bring a let's say new product or a company to India, you're not talking about product development, but really talking about creating a new market, which requires sort of many more steps than a traditional just product development. So what you see here is what we have developed is what we call a four step approach where we, when we identify a, a suitable technology and I'll, I'll illustrate that by a few examples of, of how we've done with, you know, work with a few companies is that first we you know, identify a technology, understand the technology and you know, do a market evaluation. Typically that work is and can be done by a consulting company, could be either a specialized consulting company or a journalist consulting company. But what's the extremely important step that we have, which we've added to all this is what we call doing a lighthouse project. Lighthouse project meaning establishing a project, proof of concept, not a technology proof of concept, but really demonstrating how that technology will work in India and how that technology will make money. Because ultimately, it has to be a very, very, imp what's very important for us is that we're driven very commercially and for any amount of reasonable scaling, it's very important that the, the, you know, the technology should be able to be viable, commercially viable on its own, right? So that's a very important step that we, uh, uh, that we take. And then finally, of course, once you've demonstrated that, we set up a local company, invest in the local company and scale it up, et cetera, et cetera. So phase one, typically you would see is done by consulting companies, phase three and four, setting up the local company is done by VC of a private equity. But what we do is bring this element of doing this um, lighthouse project where we are really creating a market, demonstrating what the right business model for that could be, and then do that. And this could be either through good investment or combine, combine it with some public funding the idea of any kind of public or private funding is to achieve scale in the market, to achieve commercial viability in the Indian market. And that's something that we feel is, is, is quite important. That's something that we, we believe we are a bit different and unique than you know, some of the traditional companies that do think this kind of work. <laughs> yeah, well, as I said, you know, we are, yeah, we, we, we so I 100% understand, like, if you want to have a viable solution that actually will live into the future, it's got to be financially viable. But it's hilarious how my brain just immediately trips on that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I've been an academic myself, you know, my previous yeah, life. Right. I, I was an academic and I was very proud of, of my work, which was, which I thought was never, never going to be used by anybody. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Just had to say that. <laughs> Thanks.
<laughs> but but yeah, I, I I completely hear you. I think and that's something that what we have done, and and that's why uh, I also wanted to you know a, a part of me always says you know do something which is yeah you, know, you know think about the future. And of course, I'm not saying that that part of it has to be done. Somebody else has to do it, but somebody also has to do the real hard work yeah. on the ground. Yeah. And the kind of challenges sometimes you see, and I will maybe you know a couple of show a couple of pictures and examples of the kind of you know on the ground challenges that you see, which are which can you know make or break a technology actually. And yeah. we're talking about you know transforming. You know, we talk about transformation, right? And you have, and you have, to, and I totally understand that because, like in your earlier figures, you had coal rising, right? And the use of coal rises because it's cheap. Exactly. I exactly. mean, if you don't answer the financial problem, then you're yeah. yes, you may have a perfect technological solution, but it won't be adopted. So I 100% agree. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, so see, I'm based in Europe, right? And and Europe, of course, has been one of the leaders when it comes to clean tech. Clean technology, right? And it was dri driven by you know the climate activists and all that. It was very good. It, it gave, but then sure, activism makes you, it makes you feel good about yourself. But but, but so. ultimately, yeah, ultimately, you know, for a consumer in India, who you know, uh, you know, for them, yeah, they want they want power. That's they right. don't care where it comes from, right? And That's what right. I believe is very very strongly believe is that actually, green power, solar power, is Cheaper than coal power if done properly, mm -hmm. and the side of side effect is is clean. Yeah, and I think and, and and that's very important because otherwise what happens is that if if things are, you know, I think subsidies or, or grants and things can be like a drug. Yeah. Right. And if you're dependent 100% of the business model is dependent on that, there's so much uh, subsidy that can be given, right? I mean, you can you, you can use subsidy subsidies as a bait and switch, essentially, absolutely. right? You get people addicted to the clean tech, and then you pull out the subsidy, and they suddenly are paying more, and it's effectively the Walmart model, right? Yeah, but that's something that, that that is that is not sustainable. Yeah, that is not sustainable. Right, and, and I think India has shown, and you know, you know that it, it's possible to actually have a very sustainable business model because then there is scale, and that's what happens, right? When you have scale. The prices will come down. The market will discover it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So anyway. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. No, this is this is an important topic. I completely understand. So, so in terms of uh, uh, the kind of uh, you know, uh, we've been you know we've been active in the market for about five years. I've been I'm still an entrepreneur. Done, done various things, but this technology transfer is something we've been doing last five years, and we work with several companies. Uh, um, a global, uh, you know, some of the leading companies in Europe and North America, in uh, in various domains, in grid, the smart grid, smart cities, like uh, um, uh, companies in demand side management, companies in grid digitalization, companies in uh, 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 lithium ion battery technologies, uh, energy management system, hydrogen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have, we have a good track record. I'll, I'll, I'll again talk about a couple of examples, show a couple of examples of what we have done, and. And of course, we've also we now sort of getting some recognition as well. The one of our projects, and I'll talk about that. We just got a, a, a UNEP grant for, for doing a real live scale uh, pilot. And again, when we do a pilot, and I'll show you, it's not about just demonstrating the technology. It's really about showing, okay, how is that going to now scale up? How how are we going to introduce it to the market so it can be scaled up and adopted by the countries, right? We're doing a, a, a project with support of uh, Innovate UK for bringing novel uh, energy storage type of systems in India. Uh, yeah, we are we are kind of participating in all different kind of things, right? So yeah, so I'll just talk about two uh, two sort of case studies, two examples of projects. One is uh, uh, something in the smart city domain, uh, bringing a, a Swiss smart lighting uh, company to India using a model. You know, we we started work with them. It's a, I'll, I'll show you the the details of the technology in 2020 uh, with the market evaluation. Then we did a lighthouse project again because this is a company which is one of the leaders in IoT based lighting solutions. European leaders in there, so good presence in India. Sorry, Europe worldwide, primarily Europe, not there in India yet. So we did 
uh, a project, um, a lighthouse project in, in Delhi. I'll show, uh, I'll show that. And then um, we've now created a joint venture company in India where we are, uh, we are transferring the technology into India, manufacturing that in India, and the idea is to scale it up. So just to show you, so this is a Swiss company. This is a very interesting example of what uh, there is. You know, Kur is a small uh, 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 town, about 30,000 people uh, in the Alps. And this is uh, so the map of, of, of the, of the uh, picture of, of, of the school, the city, before smart lighting solutions were, uh, were, were deployed here. And on the, on the right, you see after deployment of the smart light solution. But with, without reducing the quality of the lights, a quality of the, you know, you'll be able to reduce night pollution by 90%, more than 90%, and energy consum consumption by, by, uh, by, 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 by 90%. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it works, right? And, and this, this is the kind of thing that can happen, right? Significant reduction in energy consumption. So I think the transition to net zero will require not only, um, uh, let's say green energy, but also require, you know, other technology, like technologies for saving energy savings as well. Oh, and I, remember which, I, I remember, sorry, I have a question about about yeah. this, for example. So, if you transfer this technology from Switzerland to India, yeah. um, Switzerland's a very expensive country, right? So, yeah. so, so what is cost effective in Switzerland is not necessarily going to be cost effective in India. So how did you manage that? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, exactly that's a very very good question. See, Switzerland as you very rightly said is one of the most expensive countries in the world, right? But it is also if you look at the competitiveness, they're always number 1 or 2 in the world when it comes to technology. And how does that work? It works by Firstly, and the way we operate is that uh, the way we look at it is that how do we convert into something expensive into an OPEX model, productivity model, right? So, for example, in this example, I'll, I'll show you, I'll, I'll, show, I'll share some data with you and see how that can work. Because let's say example of, uh, before we talk about uh, uh, this particular example, solar PV as an example. Uh, solar photovoltaic, the cost of solar photovoltaic in India, let's say in, in, in a, on a rooftop solar, in Europe, North America, if somebody sets up a solar plant on their roof, maybe cost twenty thirty thousand dollars right? Twenty thirty thousand dollars for an American or European is probably not a lot of money. But for a normal Indian, it's a lot of money, right? right. Upfront capital investment is very, very expensive. Yeah. What you can do is you can convert capex into opex, which means that instead of selling the solar PV panel to them, you sell electricity to them, which in the long term is much cheaper, right? So these are the kind of things that we do. What we like to do is come up with some new models, and I'll show you, illustrate uh, in this ex uh, example how we do it. How do we convert the higher capex for bringing something which is a bit more expensive, but spreading that over a period of 10 years, 15 years, so that the consumer does not have to pay the full price up front, but has net saving over the lifetime of the asset. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll, I'll show you, well, I'll remember, show you. Uh, but, but ultimately, I mean, I mean are they still gonna, is it a different model? Or are they still gonna have to pay off the lifetime of the asset? So what will happen is uh, uh, you, you have savings, okay. right? So um, uh, because you have savings, you offset the, the, the so, um, so, you, you, so the consumer does not have the ability to pay a large, a large cost upfront, right? right? So you say, okay, you can, let's say uh, it costs $10,000. Let's say you take an example, right? right. The consumer right. can pay only 5,000. Right. Okay. You say, okay, the consumer pays 8,000 even less, and the remaining is paid off over a period of 10 years by the savings that they get. So the net net of the total cost of ownership basis 
they come out to be cheaper than what they were. You know, See, you I'm know. wondering if if you're working with utilities to take on some of the costs in the same way. Like if you if you look at what um, I don't know if Ravi is on the call, but uh, we have a member who's from Reliance Geo who uh, who's yeah. from Reliance Geo. On the call, who was the Vikas, the the sheet is on the call. Maybe we can ask Vikas is there. But um, you know, but if you think about what they did in India, they essentially like they offered the 5G plans at such a low, such a cheap rate, and they took on you know part of the cost themselves uh, in order to. Well, you're working with utilities in that way uh, to encourage um, yep. encourage people to do that. Yeah, so that's one way, of course. But the other way is what happened with solar PV, where you had solar PV. So you you know the companies have emerged, private companies have emerged, which say, okay, you go to a to a household, say, okay, give me the roof, I will invest. In putting solar PV, and that happens in the US as well, by the way. Not, India is not unique in that, right? Uh, I'll I, I invest in uh, uh, solar PV on the roof. I, I'll put up the solar PV and sell you power at a price which is cheaper than what you're buying from the grid. And that's right, easy. Right, right. It, yeah, and that, that definitely, yeah, and that works because they, they say they work out the payoff, the payoff to be 20 years, right? And exactly. so if you, if you, can work out that the payoff is still 20 years, then okay, maybe that works, right? But somehow, if you know, given that you know you're selling, if, but if you're selling the same, the same thing and salaries are lower, then you know the payoff might be 100 years, right? Then people aren't going to do it, right? That's what I'm trying to figure out here. No, no absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. You're you're, you're right, but that, but that's not the case. Right, okay. and that's where that's the whole point of also demonstrating the business model. Mm -hmm. How do you take something which is a bit expensive, convert that into a some kind of a you know a, a op opex model, where yeah. the payoff is within a reasonable period of time, the consumer does not have to take the risk upfront. You create a business which is able to take that risk. And for that business to be able to take that risk, it has to be either somebody like Realize Geo, a very large company, or a technology company that understands the risk, which understands that uh, the capital is, is marrying technology with capital and, and bringing it to a country like India or, or Africa or where, wherever the affordability, where the affordability is not as much as it would be in the Western world, where people would just buy it, you know, buy it straight away. You know, yeah. Municipalities here have enough money in Switzerland. They buy the uh, they buy the lines, but when, when you go to municipality in India, they are struggling. They don't have capital. So what we have is lighting as a service model. So we say, okay, not this Vikas from Reliance Geo. Uh, there is uh, another model which is emerging, and this is very innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say uh, uh, there is a solar panel installed uh, at the top of your roof. Yeah. And uh, it is connected to the grid. Uh, yeah. And in case you have surplus uh, energy, you will get paid for uh, whatever energy you are putting it to the grid uh, instead of like so you are paying and now you're getting money uh, if you're not using that amount of uh, energy. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Demand side management, absolutely. So those kind of things, you're absolutely right. And that's, that's the whole beauty of the whole thing. The, you know, what, what, the, what this does is, so for example, something like this, an IoT based lighting. So this solution that we have, uh, this solution is not only about reducing. Uh, let me do one thing before we continue this. I'll just show you a quick video to show how it works. And then we can, you know, you, you get an idea of what we're talking about, right? I'll just show you a quick video. Hopefully it'll come now. So this is a, a project that we installed in one of the campuses, university campuses.
So what happens is that when there's nobody, there's, uh, you know, the lights dim or switch off or dim, depending on your uh, comfort level. So typically on a campus, whether the light's being used or not, is on all the time. These are smart lights, they create a mesh or 2.4 uh, gigahertz uh, uh, Zigbee protocol. All the lights are talking to each other. If there's movement, people are, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, Duane, uh, Duane, you're saying something. I didn't, didn't see your message. I, you're, oh, you're muted. muted. You're muted, yeah. Duane. Yeah. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just asking for a copy of your slide and just say that sure. if there's anyone to help your firm, just to let me know. I think this is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm more than happy to. So, so this example that I showed you, so here, what we've been able to demonstrate, so this project has been running now for, for about two years, an actual savings of about 70%, right? So there's a CapEx investment, which is a bit more expensive than what a traditional light would be. But there's 70% saving. So payback for the extra capex is less than five years. And the, and the, and the light can be owned for, you no, know, and the light lasts for 10, 10 years, 10, 20 years. Right. And here, in addition to the, the, uh, the light savings, these are smart lights with all kinds of different sensors. There are radar sensors that, that can monitor traffic. There, there are pollution monitoring sensors, et cetera, et cetera. So on top of it, and this is all cloud-based, so on top of it, you can also sell these services as well, which can add another revenue stream. So what suddenly what happens is you have an expensive light, but by combining savings and other data, uh, those revenue stream that come from data, you actually have a payback, which is a very reasonable payback. And then now we're talking about a business a company which can actually provide light as a service to the consumer, as opposed to selling light bulbs because, uh, to the consumer. And, and that's, so those are the kind of things that you're talking about. And that's how a lot of the innovation is coming to countries like India and probably to some of the other geographies where the ability to pay is not very good, right? Um, I, I think this is quite fascinating. Um, especially because the Li-Fi standards is beginning to reach scale. Those who are not familiar with Li-Fi, that is the thing that's supposed to come out. It's not going to eliminate Wi-Fi, but light bulbs are getting ready to be a connectivity source, and yeah. that would that's a whole nother service coming. Yeah. Wait, how is this related to what Leo is doing for the B sensors with LoRa? Oh, Dwayne, you're muted again. LoRa is a is an unlicensed um, sensor standard. Um, NB-IoT is a licensed sensor standard. And, and, all, and all you talk about getting through there is security throughout the architecture or, or especially at the edge. However, those, those things are, sensors are going to always be there in the IoT things. Yeah. But this use case analysis is what gets us down to where Africa can afford it and emerging markets can afford it. And, and in the other larger countries, I guess they, we have to reach that scale first. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so this particular technology, of course, Laura, Laura Van has been around for some time. This particular technology that we are using is slightly more advanced than the Laura uh, Van technology, and we've also been able to demonstrate in certain use cases. Uh, uh, of course, because more advanced is a bit more expensive as well, but certain use cases. Payback can be better than the lower van technology as well. Yeah, I'm happy to again you know, share these slides and have a, have 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 one-on-one -on -one discussions with anybody who might be interested in this. Um, I I I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, this week I'm I'm pretty much in an argu argument with myself on stating that. Um, smart cities will not be sustainable until we can have smart agriculture because of the, the rise in population. And mm -hmm. do you have any opinion on that? So I can um, try to see if I'm arguing with myself properly. No, you're, I, you're absolutely right. And again, you know, uh, this whole, whole field is subject is such a vast field. 
and we do have a couple of companies in 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 in, in Switzerland and 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 in Europe which are looking at that, and that's a I, I completely agree with you. I think it has to be a, the approach has to be very very holistic. And we are talking about smart agriculture. We are also talking about you know, urban agri agriculture. We are talking about you know decentralized agriculture. We are talking about all kinds of things. Absolutely. Um, do you have a perception on the sand batteries? I'm seeing that's starting to reach scale. Um, um, I guess one of the things is that um, you know we, we've seen them people just taking the sand and making a big battery out of it, and then the other thing was on the nuclear side where they were taking they were combining it with a the solar arrays and and use and just heating the salt into a molten state at night um, so that it retains the heat. As you were talking about for the alternative energy, it has to be consistent to the grid at um, at morning and night. And also in Jamaica, we, we were doing a lot of this in Jamaica, they just didn't have the capital to, to do it. But um, but do you have any thoughts there? Are sand batteries realistic yet? Um, well, um, yeah, I can't, I can't talk about sand batteries. The only thing I can say is that when it comes to batteries, there is of course a lot of research is, is happening. A lot of new things are coming. Right, so lithium ion, which is today, let's say, quite may become becoming more much more mainstream. It's very good if you're talking about uh, applications which are maybe a few minutes up to four hours, four and a half hours storage. But then you need storage for at very, very high frequency storage for grid regulation. You have things like flywheels and supercapacitors, etc. And then for long term storage, lithium ion becomes very expensive. So the kind of technology that you're talking about, molten salt technologies, uh, gravity-based technologies, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, iron zinc technology, a lot of lot of lot of work that's happening, and I think we are, we are really at the very beginning of of the whole energy storage thing, because without without storage and without different scales of storage, you cannot. You, it's, it's impossible. Uh, 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 to deal with the uh, intermittency and also the the nature, you know, where, where you, you know you need power when you when you need it, right? Which is something that renewables do not do. So yeah, yeah. And again, I'll be happy to to also have a separate discussion with a uh, CEO who, who is COO who is expert on batteries, so we can have much more detailed discussion about different types of chemistries and different types of technologies there as well. Happy to have a conversation about that. Um, do you feel that clean energy pipeline may be at risk because none of this stuff is being taught in, at the high schools or, or very little at the college? Um, we don't have a, a workforce ready to handle this. Do you have that perception, any? Yeah, training is going to, uh, will, will, will play a very, very important role in, 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 in getting it. Absolutely. I think there's a transformation that is happening. Change is happening. People have to, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm reading about, you know, some of the strikes that are happening in the U.S. and the automotive industry that is related also to the transformation that's happening in the whole, whole, whole mobility sector, right? So there is a change that is happening, and then change will impact also, you know, the way things are taught, what needs to be taught, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where I believe that countries like India, emerging countries where the legacy systems are not there, you know, when you start something new, it's much easier. Um, yeah. Um, I have uh, one question related to sure. solar PVs and uh, mm -hmm. The cost and its economics, how it's affecting, like most, uh, I see uh, in India, many of these uh, mid scale and large scale solar plants. I think there is a, a too much boom in last, let's say, 2 years and I've seen several such plants getting constructed by mm -hmm. and many people involved, like constructing it. But the major cost of the plant is with the solar PVs and mostly of those are the imported PVs. Uh, coming mostly from the China and some local money manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But in that case, the solar PVs cost, what do you think the trends like for the solar uh, solar PVs cost? Because 
I think maintaining the uh, solar power plant, like a one megawatt kind of a plant at this point, is it? To me, I don't think it's still a kind of a financially um, sustainable solution because the payoff period for such a scale plant in India is around like 15 years or so, if I'm not wrong, uh, if you consider all the cost. So to make it a financially sustainable, the major cost equipments like a solar PVs and all, the, that cost needs to be reduced to the level that it's, it's sustainable. So what do you think is uh, are the yeah. directions on getting that yeah. cost down? So, see, the, the costs have, have come down dramatically in the last five years already. You know, um, I think uh, six, seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, um, when, when solar PV first started in India, uh, the, the cost of energy, producing energy, because ultimately uh, uh, the, the cost is determined by two factors, right? One is, uh, of course, the capex or the efficiency of the solar cell. Right, and you have to look at the, the cost of energy or the lifetime of the asset. Right, so 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 the costs have have come down because the efficiency of solar cells have increased dramatically, and also the the you know, the, the, the the price of the balance of system has also come down. So the solar PV uh, cost of, re of producing energy from solar PV about six seven years ago was almost about 20 cents per unit. And today, for smaller rooftop power plants in India, at least, has come to around five or six cents. And the consumer today, when they are paying, uh, they're pay in India, it's about 10 cents. So the cost of solar energy has become very competitive. The challenge of uh, solar PV, of course, is, is during the day, and you need it at night. So when you add storage, that's going to, that's what makes it very expensive. So I think I'm not too concerned about the cost of solar PV. I think what, what we have to watch out now is cost of storage, which is going to determine what is called in India around the clock energy. Mm -hmm. so how do you, how do you provide around the clock energy at a price which is affordable below the cost of coal? So we look at the numbers, you look at the numbers from IEA. Today, with today's pricing and today's lithium ion battery pricing, the cost of solar PV plus energy storage compared to uh, cost of per unit of electricity, uh, if you compare that with a new build power plant, solar PV is cheaper, including storage. If you take an old plant where the capex has already been, uh, you know, depreciated, then yes, coal beats today. But any new build, it makes no sense today, a country like India, to build a co new coal power plant. Oh, that's interesting to know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that insight. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have five minutes left. I had just one more quick example. I can either skip it or I can show it. Uh, a second company that we are working with, which is on a grid digitalization. So basically, as uh, uh, here, this is also quite interesting. As more renewable energy comes into the grid, particularly at the distribution level, there's a whole transformation that's also happening, right? Uh, because at the see, if if you look at the grids today, and again, I'm talking about India. Uh, Indian grids are becoming much more sophisticated. At the medium and high voltage, there is a lot of automation. But it comes to the distribution level, so uh, 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 there, uh, the utilities are completely blind right now. And as more um, intermittent source of uh, supply, so, so rooftop solar PV comes comes into the mix, also intermittent usage with EVs, etc., they they come to the mix. There is absolutely no visibility, and that's creating havoc. And I can create havoc with the with the grid. So what we're also trying to do now is trying to bring a little bit of intelligence to the low voltage grid level, which actually is much more complex than high high voltage grid level. So there's a German company which has a energy platform um, where you can 
combine all the data and use it for real time monitoring, historical data analysis, simulation forecasting, use that for better asset, ma asset management, asset planning. I, I don't have time to go into too much detail. I'm happy to share this with you, but just show you a couple of examples. So this is a project that we are doing actually uh, deploying on a real life scale, uh, which is funded by United Nations, UNEP. It's a 20 month project started 1st of December uh, uh, and uh, we finished 31st of July. Give you a couple of, uh, you know, in, in one of the areas in, in Delhi, Delhi, you know, as you probably know, is a very, very large, about 20 million uh, population city. And this is the area where we are deploying it. This is the state of the, of the grid. And this is where, this is the problem that we're talking about. These are real life pictures. Actually, these are the pictures I took. And this is how the grid looks like. I'm trying to bring some sanity into this kind of a picture. This is what we're trying to do in a very real, real life scenario. So what we have done is very early stages of the work here. Uh, we have installed some uh, uh, some very high resolution meters, and we're integrating that into the uh, to uh, with, with the low voltage grid transformers, and basically using the the uh, uh, this video's energy platform, uh, trying to bring some let's say rationality to this grid and using it for better grid planning and grid management so that as uh, more and more renewable uh, intermittent sources of both generation and uh, consumption come into the grid, uh, so that can be managed properly and in a much more efficient way. So I think I don't have time for much more, but this with this, I think in my presentation, we are kind of almost an hour to the, to the presentation.